Hey, this is Jen Pilcher. And when I'm not helping military spouses connect in our digital community, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and hey there, stackers. This is your official notice that it's time to change uniforms from money nerd to board game nerd. While everyone else is at the mall, we'll be huddled around the kitchen table with a game today, enjoying a few laughs as long as OG doesn't buy all the purple properties. (laughs) Actually, that's kind of funny. Hey, here today to talk about money, economic, and business-themed board games, we welcome from the Dice Tower podcast, Eric Summerer. And instead of our Friday FinTech segment, we'll throw the spotlight on one firm down under that's created a money-themed board game. From Australia-based Life Sherpa, we welcome Vince Scully. Good eye, Mike. Glad to have you. That didn't sound Australian at all. And now, two guys who are the Baltic and Mediterranean Avenue of this podcast, Joe and O J J J J G. I'll be whichever one is $6 rent. You're the $4 rent. I'm the $6 rent. <laughs> if Doug knew anything, he definitely knows that I'm totally Park Place. <laughs> you are, t- <laughs> are you Park Place or are you just Boardwalk? No, Park Place. That's way cooler. Yeah. Did I tell you, by the way, that, that I played Monopoly by the rules recently? Maybe we'll talk about that later. Hey, everybody. Welcome oh. to our annual Black Friday episode where all week long we've been talking about deals Today, we'll talk about friends and board games and family, all the things you want to do instead of out there braving the crowd. And a guy who we're surprised is here instead of at the line down at Best Buy, it's our good friend, OG. I was at the line at Best Buy at 4 a.m. Good. And did you get get that uh, 72 inch tube TV? (laughs) Like Andrea Warwick said uh, on Monday, the one with only one HDMI input, which is why it's on sale like half off. Yeah, and yes. you can't plug your speakers into it, and it sounds like a tin can. But hey, it's only 150 bucks. Yeah, yeah. So did you get in a fist fight? Oh, two of them actually. I started one, and then I was the, and then I, and then I was. Uh, <laughs> it's like the. Uh, did you see on eBay that you can buy a Walmart vest? <laughs> no. That, so you buy the Walmart vest, and then you just walk in the employee entrance. Oh my God! Are you kidding and me? And then you just go hang out, like buy the cool thing that you want, <laughs> and when they open the door. You just strip off the vest to grab your stuff and, and off run. You go. Yes. We should have talked about this two days ago because now it's kind of too late. That is well, I'm glad we didn't because we don't want to be a part of that. We are. Yeah. We're fist fights and yes, best bylines. But uh, we got a great show today. Today is our annual board game episode, which is also one of our favorite shows of the year. We're skipping the headlines today, OG. We're just going to talk God. board games with Eric Summer. So I'm bored already. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that's why i'm sure you're probably just going to sit in the back but big thanks to magnify money for supporting stacky benjamins you know on a day like today you want to save 450 bucks you want the big savings it's not down at the mall or at best buy it's at magnifymoney.com stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money probably digging into that checking account maybe into the savings account today and if you actually you switch them up you get 400 bucks it's like more gifts for your favorite podcasters <laughs> i mean if you wanted to do that yeah theoretically speaking uh stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money there also is a credit guide in there a lot of people are using credit mm-hmm. today maybe not a great idea but they're doing that so a great credit get guide getting your credit together also uh if you want to pay less interest to the man consolidation loans student loan refinancing all the good stuff is it magnify money that's totally when you're at the line at Best Buy and you go to pay and you swipe your card and you say, oh, I can't believe that worked again. <laughs> <laughs> or you go, I don't know who this OG fella is, but he is in for a surprise next month. <laughs> it's going to be incredible. Yeah, when he gets his. But but thank you. We got a great show today. Eric Summer is the co-host of the Dice Tower podcast. One of the You didn't even know there was a whole world of board game podcasts, did you? I figured there was a board game podcast. I be unlikely to have more than one, but uh, I'm just kidding. This stuff's cool. I am very proud to say there are tons of board game podcasts, but this is the king. 
the Dice Tower. A couple of years ago, we had Tom Vassell on from the Dice Tower. Today, we're going to have our friend Eric Summer. You know where Eric's from, by the way? Kalamazoo, Michigan, hmm. which is where all the cool people are from. Firewheel Casino. Yes, sir. <laughs> I love how you know Kalamazoo by the casino that's in Battle Creek right next door. Nice job. Well, you know, that's how you know you're almost a Kalamazoo. That that it absolutely is how you know. But Eric Summer joining me from the Dice Tower. Let's say hi to Eric. And coming down the stairs to the basement, it's our friend Eric Summer from the Dice Tower. How are you, man? I'm doing all right. How are you? Well, I'm fantastic. Well, this is my favorite episode of the year because we get to talk about board games. Oh, boy. I love talking about board games. I know you do. So you've been on the Dice Tower for how many years? I've been sort of a contributor to the Dice Tower since 2007 or 2008, but I've been a co-host since 2009. So I'm approaching my 10-year anniversary as co-host of the Dice Tower. People call us the grandpas in our little field, Eric. You guys are like great, great, great grandpas. It's starting to feel that way. So yeah, I guess I have to agree. Let's talk about board games, though. I mean, everybody else here on Black Friday, they're out shopping. We, of course, sit around playing board games. Is that what you generally do on uh, Black Friday as well? That is a bit of a tradition, yeah. We've typically done a family gathering, done a game day. I actually am putting it off this year. I will be uh, traveling and visiting relatives on Black Friday, but I will be doing a game day after Christmas this year because I can't go a whole year without the family game day. So we'll be doing it. Uh, I've got uh, relatives. My brother's coming out from LA. So it's going to be a good time to play games. Let's talk about your relationship with board games. When did you start digging into board games? Oh, I mean, I I always played them. I remember staying up late uh, with my mom teaching me Risk and Monopoly. We'd have games of Monopoly that would last multiple days. We'd play for a while and we'd go to bed and come back and, and finish the game. So I was always, games were always a part of my life, but I really got into the designer stuff, the really heavier stuff. Just at the end of college, started playing Pokemon, the trading card game in college. And then while looking for places to buy Pokemon cards, we found game stores that sold these games, Transamerica and the Settlers of Catan and these cool, you know, hobby board games that we love so much now. I love the fact that, you know, you mentioned games like Transamerica. I don't think people understand how easy some of these games are. Oh, yeah. There are certainly lots of complex games out there, but there are so many entry-level board games that are designed for people who have only experienced like Monopoly and Sorry. And they're just as simple as those games. They just don't have the market reach. And many would consider them significantly better than Monopoly and Sorry. They're out there. Yeah, it's funny you say that. My mom absolutely loves Transamerica and uh, games like Cartagena. Oh, yeah. Very, very simple games. Azul is now making the rounds of our family. But I'm very happy that you're here to talk about money and economic games. And just to let everybody know, I'm not really worried about people learning anything. Of course, that's the theme of the show. If you learn anything, keep it to yourself. But I'm very much interested in kind of setting setting the tone, you know, setting the spark. Like, you know, when I first uh, played a game called Power Grid, which Eric, I'm sure is a game you know really well. When I first played Power Grid, I didn't know anything about utility companies. It really didn't teach me anything. But now whenever I see things about utilities in the newspaper or on my flipboard, I'll sit and read it because I'm like, oh, wind power. I know a little bit about that. Or and so it kind of it kind of sets the tone. So thanks for helping us do yeah. that today with money games. What are some of your favorite money games out there that maybe people can check out? Okay. Well, let, let's start with the really crazy heavy one first. Let's get this one out of the way. It's called Food Chain Magnate. This is a game about running a fast food empire. You've got a big grid that have houses and stuff on it, and you you have to advertise your product. You have to get employees, and you've got like a corporate structure. You draft these cards and put them into a neat little grid and hire these people and pay them each round and make burgers or pizza or uh, sell beverages. And you have like little routes, and you can advertise with mailers. You can advertise with billboards. You can advertise with airplanes, radio towers. And it's all about growing your empire and your business and your production line and investing so that you have this great corporate structure and and beat out your opponents selling all these burgers and stuff. 
What are some of the jobs that you get? I've only played this game one time and and you're right. It was incredibly, it was incredibly complex. I felt like I was playing the game Lemonade Stand on steroids. You know, the old computer game Lemonade Stand? Oh, sure. Well, there's waitresses, which sort of reduce the amount that you you sell your stuff at. But if you have a lower price, you're going to sell more stuff. You You will win out in the war of the burgers. You've got corporate people, too, who can add more employees under you, that can hire more people, that can train employees. You can upgrade uh, fry chefs or burger cooks or pizza chefs into being like major pizza assembly lines and produce tons of them. <laughs> it's so many different things you can do. You can, And you have one player that has a giant corporate structure with a big old network of people. And then you have somebody else that's kept their their group to like only five employees at a time. And they just have a bunch of waitresses with low prices. They're selling the cheap hamburgers, but they're still doing business. How many times have you played this game? Uh, I want to say it's about half a dozen. They take a little while to play. This one is certainly complex. It's deep, but it's satisfying. You really feel good when you get like a profitable business going and you start seeing the money coming in. It's tricky, but it's really fun. Yeah. And you really do learn a lot about business here. I mean, it really felt like I was managing all the pieces of a business from, like you said, from the advertising to the uh, price of the goods. I think you have to buy. Did you have to buy the supplies? You have to create them. You have to employ the people that are going to create those things. And you have to make sure you get rid of them or they spoil. You know, you can't make a bunch of pizzas and then not sell them. Like if somebody comes and undercuts your price or starts advertising a different product and you can't provide that other product, you might be really out of luck. You might have a ton of pizzas, but you don't you can't sell beer. And if somebody's advertising pizza and beer together and the households want those two things, you can't provide them. You might be in big trouble. And who doesn't want those two things? Exactly. Yeah, of course. By the way, as we go through these, all these awesome games Eric's talking about, I will have a link to all them on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Well, I didn't think you were going to start there. That's fantastic. That's a, that is definitely an economics lesson in that game, Eric. Oh yeah. Well, okay. So let's talk about, uh, still we're in the restaurant industry, but we're going to back off a little bit. This game's called Kitchen Rush. It's a real time cooperative simulation of running a restaurant. Everybody's got these little sand timers. And every time you want to do something in the game, you have to turn a sand timer over. And when that sand timer is done, you've done that action. So you've got stations. Your your board is all about the restaurant. You've got waiters that can serve customers. You've got people washing dishes. You've got chefs preparing recipes. You've got people buying ingredients. You've got these storerooms with ingredients in it. So every time you prepare a dish, you have to get the ingredients and make sure they all come together into that dish. And, of course, you're timed. You only have maybe 15 minutes to run around and serve as many customers as possible, but you have to sort of work together to go shopping and wash the dishes. If you run out of dishes, you can't serve your customers. It's fascinating and chaotic and difficult. I have yet to win this one. Really? Yeah, I haven't played that many. I've played Food Chain Magnate far more times than I've played Kitchen Rush, but this one is a a simpler, easier to grasp sort of thing, but a very visceral simulation of trying to run a business and be profitable. Yeah, I would say Food Chain Magnet is probably, what What would you say, 14, 15 or older? Yeah, that's probably a good, good estimate. What about this game, Eric? I think you could probably play this with 10-year-olds and not do too badly. You could go a little younger because it is cooperative. You can always assist each other and help each other out. But I'd say 10 is probably a good starting point for Kitchen Rush. I would imagine there's a lot of talking back and forth in Kitchen Rush. Oh, there's a lot of, yes, talking, yelling, screaming. Yes. <laughs> that sounds like good holiday fun. What else? Yes. Uh, well, let's let's talk about like a very simple economic engine. The game is called Splendor. Have you talked about this on the show before? No, we haven't talked Splendor at all. My wife loves this game. Oh, this game is great. This game is all about gems, gem trading and buying and, and delivering. And the gems are represented by these gorgeous poker chips. They clink together. They come in, I think, five different suits. There's also a wild suit. And on your turn, you can grab some gems. You can grab, uh, I think, two of the same type of gem or three different gems. And you're doing this to fulfill orders. There's a bunch of cards on the table that all have different prices. So you may need to uh, turn in two blue gems and one red gem to get this card on the table. So you do that. That's another thing you can do on your turn. Instead of taking gems, you can spend gems and buy a card. You can take this card, and now I have that that card comes in a suit as well. It may produce blue gems. And now if I have something that costs three blue gems, 
and I have a blue gem card in front of me, well, now I only need two blue gems because I have one of them in front of me. I'm now producing more gems and able to buy more expensive cards. And it's this snowball thing where you're, you're trying to get the gems before other people do, buy the cards before your opponents do, and, and create this engine and eventually earn enough points to cross the finish line. It's quick, it's simple, but it has enough depth to it that it really feels exciting when you can stay ahead of your opponents. It totally does. And even if I can't stay ahead of my opponents, there's just, I don't know, this, this kind of puzzle solving aspect to it really keeps me in the game. Absolutely. And it's the whole like visceral nature of it as you're, as you're clinking these chips together and, and deciding whether you want to grab more because you can only hold like 10 gems at once. Do you want to keep collecting things or do you want to start buying those cards before your opponents get a chance to? And you're looking over it across the table. Do you have enough gems to take that card I want? No, you don't. But maybe you're going to take that card and reserve it and save it for later so I don't get it because that's something you can do too. It's neat to watch your opponents and try and guess what they're looking at. Yeah. And different than the first two games that you mentioned, which I think you find online or at, at hobby stores, I've seen this one at Barnes & Noble, at Target. You'll find Splendor, I think, pretty much all over the place. It is. It has quite the reach. It, it was, it's a couple of years old, and it's, it's really made a big splash. It's a, an extremely popular game. And uh, there's an expansion as well that adds even more complexity to it if you want to go that route. Ah, did you like it with the expansion? There's like four different modules, uh, so little little bits that you can add in, and I liked uh, a couple of them. There are some that are just extra cards you can throw in. They don't really change the game very much, and there are others that change a lot. They sort of change the way the game ends or, or the way you can interact with your opponents. I've only played a couple, like two of the four different modules there, but I enjoy what I've done. That's really neat. And this game also, I would imagine you can play with a little bit younger audience. Absolutely. My uh, seven-year-old has played the app version of Splendor without any trouble at all. That is fantastic. Love, love that one. I feel like this is uh, definitely Christmas time. We're opening up Eric's <laughs> gifts of different games. Yes. So what's the next one you have for us? Well, let's talk about one with lots of other shiny pieces. Uh, this one's called Gizmos. This is, it's sort of a, an engine building game, kind of like Splendor, but you have this, it looks like a gumball machine. It's this hopper full of marbles, colored marbles in four different colors. And they, they sort of come down a chute inside this cardboard hopper. And there are six of them available in a little chute. And you are building inventions. You're, you're grabbing these marbles and spending those marbles to take little inventions. But those inventions then help you do more things. So I may get an invention that turns yellow one yellow marble into any other color marble I want. So now I've got sort of a wild marble. Maybe I want to grab more yellow marbles. Or I may get one that every time I build a red machine, I get extra points for doing so. Or every time I build a red machine, I get to pick an extra marble. But I may build both of those. So now every time I build a red machine, I get to pick an extra marble and get extra points. And that's the whole game. It's getting these pieces, these machines that can work together and trigger each other and create this cool synergy as you make your sort of Rube Goldberg device work. And it's all surrounding these neat little marbles that are, are fun to goof around with and play and pick. Sometimes you're pulling like randomly from the hopper and sometimes you get to pull from the slide where you know what you're getting. That one's a lot of fun. That one's relatively new. It sounds like half the fun of this game is just looking at it like just the candy eye candy factor. Well, sure. I mean, that's that's one of the hallmarks of, of these modern games, too, is, is getting to see um, how they're presented and the the cool components and the pieces. They're all very shiny. Yeah, that is neat. Now, uh, and that one, you said it's newer. I find this one then at uh, more specialty hobby shops and online. Yes, although I think I want to say I've seen this at Barnes & Noble as well. I think this particular title is making headway into the big box stores as well. Awesome. Great. It also sounds like a game I can play with a little younger people. Yes, absolutely. I'm sure the marbles are going to be a draw. And the iconography is not too difficult to understand. You can sort of see um, there's not a lot of text to read. You can sort of look at a, at a, a machine and it has a picture of a yellow marble and an arrow and, an, and a little circle with an X on it. So this yellow marble can become whatever you want. Once you learn those pictographs, it's, it's pretty simple to understand what's going on. And then I think you have one more for us. I do. Uh, I had to, you know, if we're going to talk about economic games and money games, 
I have to talk about my favorite game of all time, which is uh, from 1988. It's called Merchant of Venus. I've never heard never of it. Heard of it. No, this, is, this is what's called a pick up and deliver game. You, you're flying around space and you are buying up crazy goods like mouth pelts and chickle liquor and space spice. And you're flying to other planets and selling those. And it's a race to see who can reach a certain total first. You start out with like 60 or 80 space credits and you, you're trying to race to 2,000. It's a roll and move game, but it's got all this risk mitigation. So you can fly through an asteroid field. It's extremely dangerous, but you can buy equipment that's going to make it easier for you to do so. You can spend money on a, on a drive, an engine that's going to skip dots on the board. You can, you can buy shields that will protect you from hazards, but you could do none of that and just go the long way around. It'll take you a lot longer, but it's safer and you know you're going to get there on time. And you know, because you win or lose the game based on the amount of money that you have, you're spending money to make money. So is it really worth it? I mean, I, I spent a couple games of this really decking out my ship and then realized I spent so much money, Eric, on Chrome uh -huh. that I lost the game because I overbuilt my ship instead of focusing on the end game. Absolutely. Because the ship is not going to help you in your quest. It, you're spending your victory points, basically, to make your ship better. But you need to if you really want to be effective in the game. So it's finding that tipping point. When do I stop spending money on my ship? And when do I just sort of optimize my engine? And I find that fascinating. There's exploration. There's excitement. There's die rolling. It's, it's a blast. Merchant of Venus, absolutely number one game. I find also fun in uh, finding the trade routes, like going, oh, okay, this, these people over here, they want this thing because different planets want different things. So this planet wants this good. If I deliver that there, then I deliver this over here and I create kind of this triangle. Right. And, and discovering that I also find fascinating. Right. Because, you know, you, you may think you have a really good trade route, but then you can't, you, you might be carrying goods. You don't know where to sell them. And you're exploring, trying to find the right planet, and everyone you knock on their door, you're like, do you want to buy the space spice? No, I don't want that. Do you want to buy the space spice? No, we don't care about that. And trying to find where those routes are is part of the exploration of the game. For people that just know the basic old-time games, Monopoly, Life, Risk, that kind of thing, Stratego, what type of person would you say would like Merchant of Venus? Oh, see, a Merchant is one of those that you want the... You want the calculator because there's some math in there. You've, you've got some investment stuff going on, maybe not quite as deep as food chain magnate, but you also want that sense of adventure. So we're looking for like a Firefly fan or, yeah. or a Star Trek fan. There's a lot of classic sci-fi tropes in there and, and some uh, little nods and references and stuff. So, yeah, you want a sense of adventure, but also of business. Right. Yeah. And the game is, I think you can modify the game to make it as long as you want. You could make it super long or super short. You can. I mean, you could do a like a quick game with just going to a thousand uh, or you could go to three or four thousand. And then you get to see these massive strategies uh, come into play. You can buy a giant ship that goes really slow. But when it flies into port, it just like empties out everything they've got. It buys everything that the planet sells. Uh, which is really fun to see as you've got little people, you know, folks flying a small ship around and trying to do things quickly. But then you've got these big freighters and they're trying to zip in and do their business before the freighter shows up and empties the planet out. It's really cool. Yeah. No, lots of cutthroat business going on in Merchant of Venus. Now, the version that I have, Eric, has two versions of the game. It has an older classic version and has a new version. Is that the one that's in print now that people can buy? The one that uh, it's actually, I think, a little trickier to find. Uh, but yes, that's the current. The, the Fantasy Flight Games version is the most recent version. And it has both the classic game, which I love, and what they call a new standard game, which, if you like a sense of adventure, has even more of it because you've got pirates and, and pilot checks and all sorts of stuff. Lots of extra chrome that you can deck out your ship even more with. I prefer the classic game, but you get both in the box, which is pretty cool. It's got to be so fun being on a podcast, Eric, where you talk about board games nonstop. Well, yes. Yes, it is. It's always fun. It's always nice to get away from whatever craziness I've had at work that day or, or stuff with the family and just, just talk about having fun for a while. Is it hard to keep up, though, with all the new games? I often wonder when I listen to the Dice Tower, how do you keep up with so many new games all the time? It's impossible. We just got back from the Essen Game Fair in Germany, and there were a thousand games released at Essen. 
no human can keep up with that many games. And even if you cut out all the ones that, that weren't in English, the Dice Tower team brought home three or four hundred games oh my goodness. from the fair. And it, it's just, ah, I, I personally only brought back maybe ten. That's all I can handle. And as you know, there's people in our audience that go, 10, that's all the games I have in my closet. Exactly. Yes. It is very difficult to stay ahead of everything. We try, and we're one of the few full-time board game review organizations. It's incredible how much material is out there. But that's good news for anybody that has a particular interest that wants to check out a game on a, on a particular topic. You mentioned Power Grid. If you want a game about expanding an energy empire, there's not only Power Grid, but several Power Grid spin-offs and other games on the same subject. There's a ton out there. Yeah, and boy, not just listening to the show, you guys also have videos that people can watch, but I'm so glad you can hang out with us a little bit longer and talk about, you know, it's a holiday season and there's yes. nothing more fun than family and party games. So when when uh, the summer family gets together, what, what are your, some of your favorite party games with family and friends? All right. I've got four. The first are a couple of word games. Uh, one is called Decrypto. Oh. This is a game where each team has a set of words in front of them that only they can see. The other team has a different set of words in front of them. And they get a card that says three, one, four. And so if I'm the clue giver, I'm looking at that card. I have to get my team to guess word number three, then word number one, then word number four. <laughs> we, can, we can see what those words are. So I write down my clues. The thing is, I now announce those clues to the other team as well. After a couple of rounds of this, the other team starts to realize that Clues that maybe have something to do with birds relate to word number three, if I'm not doing a very good job. So the other team gets to guess what they think my code is. So they, if they guess three, one, four, they get a point. Mm. If my team doesn't guess three, one, four, we also lose a point. So I have to give clues that are both close enough to get my team to guess correctly but also vague enough and out of the box enough that the opponents don't know what we're talking about. So it's all about being sort of sneaky in your clues and not following the same line of thinking so that the other team is like, wait, what? One clue was about straw and the other clue was about ice cream, but they both refer to word number three? I don't understand. Keeps them guessing. That one's a whole lot of fun because everyone's involved in every round. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Even while the other team is playing, you're intensely listening. Absolutely. Because not only are you trying to give the right clues for your team, but you're trying to guess the logic for the other team. Because if you guess their code enough times, I think it's just twice, you win the game. Is it hard being the clue giver? Yes, uh, because you have to look at what clues have been given before yeah. and try and give another clue that doesn't come at the word from the same direction. Because that's how the other team's going to figure it out. Gotcha. So how, what other way can I come at this word? This one's a little tricky to play with younger kids because they haven't quite got the yeah. linguistic um, gymnastics yet. If you do play with kids, you have to make sure you split them up, you know, put one on each team so that it's a little equal. They can be a spoiler on both sides. Yeah, but it sounds like a great time with adults. It is. And it's a terrific game. It's fantastic. I've never even heard of that one. That's number one on my list to get for this yes. season. So. A really neat presentation, too. It's got all this sort of classic 60s uh, Cold War era <laughs> iconography and presentation. It's pretty cool. Oh, that's neat. What else is in your bag of tricks, Mr. Summer? A similar game is called Crosstalk. This is also a word game for two teams. At the beginning of each round, you give your team a secret clue. Both clue givers are trying to get their teams to guess the same word. So then you give your team a secret clue. Only they get to see it. And then you give a clue, but the other team gets to guess first. Oh. So I need to give a clue that when you add it to my secret clue, will tell my team what the clue, what the word is. But that is not so obvious that the other team gets it right away because they get to guess first. Wow. And so then they get to guess. And if they get it wrong, then their team gives a clue. And then we get to answer first. Gotcha. And and both teams are playing with the same clue? The same clue. And so whichever team gets it first is going to score more points. <laughs> I can see myself sweating during this one. Yes, but it's that one works better for, I think, larger groups. 
that you can have sort of larger teams. And my son really enjoys this one. He's 10. He loves it. Um, and he loves the challenge of trying to come up with the clues that work for us, but not for them. Really cool. Similar game to Decrypto, but I think uh, sort of pushes a few different buttons. Another one I've never heard of before. This one fairly new also. Yes, in the last couple of years, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And also generally, Eric, when we talk about these games, the ones we presented in the first half of the show, just generally speaking, rule of thumb, those are bigger presentation games, maybe a little more expensive than these, I would imagine. Generally, yeah. The, the party games tend to be a lot um, a lot less expensive. Um, they have simpler components. They're not quite as well built out. Yeah. Okay. That's another one. You're, you're killing my pocketbook here, buddy. <laughs> Uh, what's game number three for the holiday? Game number three is one that my family has really enjoyed. It's it's called either Happy Birthday or Crappy Birthday, depending on which version of the game you want to get. They're from North Star Games, both versions. You are gift giving. Each card, it's basically just a deck of cards. Each card in this game has a picture of a strange gift. And one player is, it's their birthday in that round. And everyone picks one of the cards, a gift to give to the birthday person. And you go face down. You reveal all these these ridiculous gifts. Some are something that that person would really want. Some are the things that you would never want. And that person then guesses or picks what they would want to have for their birthday. And so you're trying to uh, give a card that that person would enjoy Or you can also play a variant where you would also, in addition to picking the thing you want the most, the thing you want the least. (laughs) So you might want to go for the thing that you think they absolutely would not want or the thing you think they would enjoy. And then whoever gets picked gets to keep that card as a point. You play to a certain number of points. The game plays very, very quickly, but it's, it's hilarious with all of these ridiculous, you might get a, uh, an underwater sub vacation or a scary clown mask that you have to hang in your bedroom (laughs) or like a sentient monkey puppet. It's all these really wacky things. And we love just laughing and, and giving these silly little gifts and saying happy birthday when we hand over these cards. (laughs) This is a very inexpensive game and I think relatively easy to track down. Happy Birthday or an earlier version, which was called Crappy Birthday from North Star Games. And it's kind of a variant of uh, the very popular Apples to Apples game, right? I mean, that's kind of how you play it. It is. It is very similar to Apples to Apples. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing I like about this game is I believe and tell me if, if this is still true. They designed it to be given as a gift. So you come to somebody's party and then you give it to the host. Like this will be a great gift if you're invited to a party and you break it out and play it right then. That is exactly the way they bill it. Yeah. I think that is really neat. And, uh, and to your point, not that expensive. I can't believe we're down to the last one. This one is an all time hit. I actually, you know, you asked for party games, but this one's a little more of a traditional table game. It's called roll for it. Depending on which version you get, it can be played from anywhere from four to eight players. And it's a dice rolling game. Everybody gets five dice. On your turn, you just roll the dice one time. And then you assign some of these dice to cards that are in the center. So you may have some cards that just need two twos. If you get two twos on that card, you get that card. Or you might need six fives in order to get this card. But the more dice that are required, the more points it's worth. Now, whatever dice I put out, I don't get to roll next turn. So I may not be able to complete a card in one turn, but I can assign dice to it, hoping to roll those numbers later. But if somebody gets that card, that combination, before I get back to it, then I get my dice back for the next turn. But it's possible to allocate too many of your dice so you can't actually complete some of these cards. You might have to take them back and spend a turn resetting. But it's this sort of simple investment game But it's a very simple die roll. You just roll the dice once um, and try and get the combinations you're looking for. It's exceedingly simple to explain, quick to play, and with such a large group, we love playing like six or eight people, playing this game, rolling the dice, taking your turn. It moves so fast and is so simple. You can swap people out and run another round, and you're just trying to get a, a certain point total. I think it's 40 points, and you win the game. It sounds like an easy, more fun version of Yahtzee. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm getting this Yahtzee feel. 
It absolutely, and yeah, it's significantly simpler than Yahtzee because it's one; it's only one role. You're not deciding what to keep or anything, but but you also get that sort of "what do I go for" feeling that Yahtzee provides. Yeah. Do you just go for those cheap little cards, those two point cards, or do you try and invest or take the gamble that you can complete the higher value cards before your opponents do? And this sounds like Eric, uh, younger kids could totally do this one. Absolutely, I think you could play this with. I don't know, five, six-year-olds? Absolutely. That's crazy. Four, four party games I've never heard of before, and I thought I was a nerd. You've got me beat, sir, by a mile. I should confess, I have a few games <laughs> in the house. Yeah, and you talk about them professionally also. So I do, yeah. yes. Yeah, so you got that too. Well, tell everybody a little bit about the Dice Tower because I've been listening to the show forever I believe when your co-host, Tom, who did this with me a couple of years ago, began the show, he was living in Korea. And I remember listening to the first like 10 episodes of this thing. But tell everybody a little bit about it because it's such a fun show. Yeah, I mean, well, the Dice Tower podcast has been running. We are we just recorded. In fact, I'm, I'm editing right now. Episode 580. Yeah. We're out weekly. Uh, we have multiple hosts now, and it's a show all about board games, card games, and especially the people who play them. We do fun stories. We do top 10 lists. We we share our experiences at conventions. It's it's really just a group of fun people talking about playing games with each other. And it's not just the podcast, because the Dice Tower exists in lots of online venues, especially on YouTube with board game reviews, video top 10 lists, video shows. I do a, a weekly or bi-weekly chat show called Dice Tower Tonight, in which we answer questions live from our, our YouTube viewing audience. It's a blast. And, and anywhere you look for board games, we try and be a definitive source for that sort of thing. And it's all at Dicetower.com. I think my favorite segment of the show is uh, Tales of Horror. I love that. These are stories that people have sent in with just horrible things that have happened to them, like a game store's radiator busting and just spraying their entire inventory of cardboard items with water. Or someone, one of my favorites, someone who left their copy of Risk 2210 with tons of little plastic robots and mechs and, ro- and, and soldiers on the roof of their car. And and for the next several years, this was at college, they left it on the roof of their car and drove away and it scattered. For years, they would be walking through campus and find little plastic <laughs> mechs in bushes and stuff. And it was just this constant reminder of how terrible things were. And, of course, I read them in a spooky voice. Gather around, children. It's fun. <laughs> it is fun. My favorite one. I think was incredibly gross. It was somebody invited a friend over who brought a friend with them. And this person, they were playing some game with cards and every single time they went to play a card, they'd lick their finger first. Oh yeah. Oh, it was so gross. I remember that one. <laughs> it was so gross. And the sad thing is I've played with someone who did that before. Just oh, boy. horrible. Or, you know, Ugh. The person who brings Cheetos to game night, by the way, everybody don't bring Cheetos to game night because it gets no. gets all over your game. Yeah. Well, Eric, thanks a ton for hanging out with us. That's great. And we'll have all of our links to all these awesome games on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Thanks a ton, Eric. Oh, you bet. This was a blast. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I gotta say, all this board game talk means we've gotta have some board game trivia, don't you think? Here's a question. It's amazing how much money's made on apps these days, and board games are no exception. You can play everything from old favorites like uh, Life and Monopoly to new hits like Ticket to Ride and Pandemic all on an app. But here's a question. What was the first board game to get its own computer game version? I'll be back with the answer in just a moment. Big thanks to Magnify Money for supporting Stacking Benjamins. At Magnify Money, especially on a day like today, OG, you can save a ton of money, around 450 bucks. Did we not just actually do this? Like literally 32 seconds ago? Did, I talked about how you'd have extra money for that your was our podcast. That, that was our pre-roll. We're doing the mid-roll now. 
Oh, well, so, but literally we did it 32 <laughs> seconds ago. It's just not in real time. Well, that's in, that, <laughs> that, that, that's in our time. Not in the, you can't give away all the secrets, man. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. That was a long time ago. Oh, right. Sorry. Yes. Yep. Yes, absolutely. My and bad. you know what, you know what happens when you go to magnify money, OG? You save or make $450. It is so incredible. And not only that, they have an award-winning blog led by our friend, Mandy Woodruff, who was mm-hmm. with Yahoo Finance for a long time and also with the Brown Ambition podcast. She leads the charge over there at Magnify Money and you can find everything. By the way, let's take a look at, well, you know what? I was going to take a look at savings account rates, but but you should do that. You're, but we're not going to do that. You can do it yourself. Yes. We're not going to do that for you today. As mom said, do we have to do everything for you? Stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, especially on a day like today. Instead of being in line, or if you are in line, take the time on your device and uh, get better financial products. Trivia fans, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor dog, and Joe's mom just beat me in three straight games of Azul. That woman's a shark. Yeah, that she knew that. Anyway, I'll get my revenge later on her, but how about today's trivia question? The question was this. What board game was the first to get its own computer game version? The answer? While Monopoly and Life and others weren't far behind, it was the classic game Battleship that first had its own computer game version. And that was way back in 1979. And coming down the stairs to the basement, all the way from the land down under, it's our good friend, Vince Scully. How are you, man? I'm good, Joe. Thanks for having me at the uh, in the basement. Your mom wasn't so scary. She even gave me some cookies. <laughs> Isn't that great? It depends on the day. I, I love how she bakes different stuff every day, but... I want to talk about something that is the elephant in the room. There's another Vince Scully here in the U.S. besides you. I don't know if you know that, that you actually have somebody. Your, your name is very well known here. It is. Interesting um, story on that. I was I arrived in New York in JFK Airport in, I think, about 92 or 93 off the Concord, which obviously doesn't exist anymore. And I walked up to the guy at immigration and produced my passport. And he said, you're not Vince Scully, are you? And I said, well, that's what it says on my passport. And then I walked out to the arrivals area and my driver, the limo driver, had, this crowd had formed around him because he was holding up this sign that said Vince Scully. <laughs> and then I walked up to this crowd and I could see the whole crowd going, you're not Vince Scully, as they disappeared. <laughs> Isn't it bad? I mean, did that hurt your ego that they were disappointed? Yes, it did. But I do outrank him on Google in Australia. Well, there you go. So if you, so if you Google Vince Scully in Australia, you get me. If you Google in the US, I think I'm on about page four. Well, we'll help you with that today. Hopefully <laughs> we'll get you up to the bottom of page three. But for the people listening that are not uh, uh, baseball fans, Vince Scully is a Hall of Fame broadcaster for uh, for a number of years. I think Last year, he finally retired, but Vince uh, was with the Los Angeles Dodgers and called some of the best games of all time. So, but but you're the cooler Vince Scully. The one that, <laughs> yeah, right. There's also a third one who's an architecture professor at Yale who's written some of the most important works on U.S. architecture. So you got two of these guys to beat. Yeah. The bar is high, Vince. Well, well it is. Well, let's talk My about My mother the- didn't know either of them. <laughs> she didn't. And had she known it, maybe. So- I was so excited. You and I met again at uh, FinCon, not our first time meeting, but you hand me this box and you said, hey, I know you're a game nerd, so you're going to want to try this game out. And I made sure that my eyes didn't roll because (laughs) when people hand me games, I'm like, oh, God, no, please. And I took it home, though. And when we were in Kansas City on our live show tour, I went with my daughter to a board game cafe. We took your game Life Sherpa with us. And we had a blast like this game. This game is super fun. It's not uh, super long. It it doesn't you know, there's some games that seem to go forever like Monopoly. This is not that game. It's over in a reasonable amount of time. You get a few light lessons. I don't like games that are overly teachy that your game is not overly teachy. It just is a good time. Tell everybody a little bit about Life Sherpa the game. What's it all about? Well, Life Sherpa game is about goals 
and life. We go through life and we need to find out our real purpose in life. So at Life Sherpa, we're financial advisors and mortgage brokers and money coaches. So we spend a lot of time talking about personality, values, and goals. So this game helps us to, in a very lighthearted way, as you say, demonstrate how you can turn money and time into goals and happiness. We're going to explain a little bit about how the game plays. Obviously, we won't be able to get into all the rules. But when you say personalities, you choose from a bunch of hilarious looking characters. These all look like characters from the early 1900s for the most part. And uh, looking at them, you've, you've got the high roller, the perfectionist, the optimist, the producer, the money master, the achiever, the safety player, the hunter, the entrepreneur. These people, you can either choose one at random, which is what my daughter and I did, or you can search the deck, right? You, you choose how you that, want to play that. That's right. Uh, we use that personality profiler tool in our coaching those characters come from a real personality profiler that we use, and we've created these 1930s avatars to embody the essence of the characters. And those characters obviously affect the way achieving goals are fixed the gameplay. Yeah, some characters have some significant downsides. Also, though, the ones with bigger downsides also have big upsides if they pursue yep. other things. Speaking of other things, so now we have our character, then we have a bunch of different goals, and most of the deck, I believe, is the goals, right? That's right. There's a series of goals. They're either personal goals or money goals or life goals or career goals or social goals. They're sort of things that we all need to do in real life to achieve happiness and fulfillment. And as you achieve your goals by applying time and money, you uh, you gain happiness points and the happiest guy at the end wins. Of course. And I love that. I love that, by the way, Vince, because obviously a lot of people starting out in life thinks the person with the most money wins, but it really is about building, building your happy. That's right. These the more happy is good happy. Absolutely. And, I, and I'll go through some of these as an example. Uh, a medium risk goal that you have here is uh, infrastructure, uh, medium risk investments, also a foreign exchange, high risk investment that you can get mm -hmm. into. You can also have some of these, some of the social goals are like to have a child, which by the way, gives you a lot of happy. Uh, Sometimes. <laughs> my, my, boy, my boys just finished high school. <laughs> Guess that counts for a lot of happy. <laughs> but, yes, Absolutely. Uh, unless you're paying for college, then maybe not so much happy. Uh, personal goals like owning a wine cellar, owning a yacht. I thought the yacht was hilarious, the luxury yacht. I love the art. Who did the who did the art on your cards? We did them in house. The icons actually come from a uh, website called Flat Icon, which is a European website, and you can license these uh, these icons. Takes a lot of searching to find them, but that was the fun part. Yeah, I thought it was fun, but, but owning a motorcycle. So you have this this group of goals, you shuffle the deck, everybody starts out with a bunch of goals in their hand, but you don't keep all those goals. You, you start off with the goals, you pick one that fits your character and then, and then you pass them. That's right. We, you, you get a, a handful of goals you, in a drafting process, you select the ones that resonate with you and or your character. So there's a bit of strategy in choosing the right goals, you know, which ones you discard and which ones you keep. Then by the time you build up to six goals, you are then ready to start playing. And then when you start playing, there are on your turn, you have these chips and some are, some are money chips and some are time chips. That's right. You get an amount of time chips and money chips and you then apply those to your goals. So some goals take more time and some goals take more money and time disappears in your round, whereas you can save money for future rounds. So just like real life, really. And in the, oh, I think we played that wrong. So your time, your time chips go away every single turn? Yes. You've either got to apply them to a goal or you lose them. So it's a use it or lo use it. Lose it or use it, should I say. That makes so much uh, sense, Vince, because when we played it, the one thing that I noticed in the game was that we were building up tons of time chips. No, no wonder we couldn't, uh, no wonder that happened. All right. We, we that got, probably comes from living in Texarkana where time goes a bit slow. It goes away. Yeah. We have our own time zone. You just set your watch back a hundred years and you're, <laughs> and you're here. The, uh, but so on my turn. I get another set of time chips. I can add to my pile of money or depending on what's happened to me, maybe my money's draining every turn because of things that have happened in my life. Yep. And I can buy different uh, cards that help me. So you've got bank loans that can help me, financial advisors that help me, insurance that can help me. Tell me about those. 
Yeah, so, so the bank system allows you to borrow money. So you can borrow money from the bank to achieve your goals. So it gives you more money in this round. You, of course, have to pay it back. And if you end the game with a bank loan outstanding, you lose happiness points in the add-up at the end. The other cards you mentioned, like the financial advisor and the CPA, they're about protecting you from events that happen. So as you are trying to achieve your goals, event cards get played each round. And they might be a you know, market crash or uh, you get sick, you get hit with some extra taxes. And by having the right protection card, so your financial advisor protects you from a market crash, uh, your CPA protects you from taxes, uh, insurance protects you from illness. So they allow you to protect your goals as you're building them. But Just like real life. Yeah. And it really, and it's a trade-off like real life too, Vince. If nothing happens to you and you had, uh, let's say, health insurance and you don't end up getting the health event card, you ended up not needing to spend that money. It was it was insurance that you didn't need. But on the other side, if you don't buy it and that card hits, it can wreck your game. Exactly. That sounds like real life to me. It totally was like real life. I love these. And just to go over a few of these that Vince mentioned, uh, health issues, give the, give this to a player. That player receives minus one each term from now on. We had fun with this because obviously we're just two of us playing. But I could imagine <laughs> if you've got like five people playing and and I'm the one that turned over the card and I get to hand it to you, I get to choose the player that's probably in the lead that I get to slow down. Yep. Uh, when you have a child, that child, you mentioned this earlier, Vince, they, they drain you of some money and time every turn. But there's a card called maturity, which says that if you have a child event card, you discard it, but you get to keep the child goal. So you still get the happiness, but now your kid has moved out. And so they don't drain you. Exactly. I've just got a whole deck of those. <laughs> That's right. I know that feeling with kids that are 23, losing your job. I had that happen in my game. That wasn't good. Uh, <laughs> uh, getting robbed, taxes, dividends. Uh, and then, by the way, if you have some of these things. So if you have the private jet goal, you get an extra extra fame point. So so these are fun. The game, the game for us, Vince, with two of us lasted lasted about 30 to 40 minutes. Is that generally how long the game lasts? Yeah, 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, we wanted something that was quick and fun to play, and you could learn very quickly, but find it hard to master. That's the secret in all of these things, is easy to learn, impossible to master. There's a lot of strategy in it once you get used to the game about whether you borrow money, which goals you pick, which personality you pick, and how you apply your 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 cash and which protections you should should and shouldn't buy. We got it's like monopoly in that sense, y- y- but very quick. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 very, very quick. And the other thing is, everybody's in the game until the end, unlike Monopoly, also. And it's That's not right. this, it's not this giant uh, sucking sound for for <laughs> for a lot of the players at the table, uh, the, uh, like Monopoly is. I found it very fun. We got done. We play. We immediately played it a second time, which uh, we don't often do. Usually, we go on to another game, but but we had so much fun with it. How do people get the Life Sherpa game? Uh, You can buy it direct from us at lifesherpa.com.au. What you have is a production prototype. It's the first real one. Uh, We had a couple of mock-ups before that. So you got one of the three production prototypes (laughs) in captivity. So we're doing a couple of little tweaks to it, and we'll be releasing it shortly. But uh, if you email me at vince at lifesherpa.com.au, I can get one shipped to you. That's awesome. And uh, what's the price point going to be? Good question. We were looking at about thirty dollars. Yeah, but it's still yeah, yeah, twenty four ninety nine. That sort of price ish. Gotcha. Uh, so at the very least, people get on a if people email you, you'll have them on a, a waiting a wait list. list. Yeah, for when it comes out. So love that. Thanks for being part of our board game episode, Vince. That's fantastic. What else is going on at Life Sherpa? Tell us a little bit about the site. Well, we were a uh, online money advice, mortgage broking, and financial advice site aimed at younger people. So our audience are late 20s to early 40s, and they're going through those stages of life. They're coupling, nesting, and parenting, and they go through all of those problems about paying off student loans, um, buying their first home, worrying about retirement savings, paying off their debts, and are largely ignored by the financial planning industry, which is focused on assets under management. Right. So we start with a $15 a month subscription, which gets you access to your advisor or Sherpa, as we call them. 
And the whole concept of the Sherpa is about being your guide in life. You know, the Sherpa who helps you climb Mount Everest doesn't take the credit for climbing Mount Everest. They share their knowledge and get you there. But which summit you climb is up to you and your achievement is your achievement. We're there to carry the bags and guide you. I love that analogy. And we'll link to Life Sherpa and I'll have your email address, by the way, so people can get on the, the wait list for the game at stackybenjamins.com. Vince, thanks for uh, coming halfway across the globe for our special board game episode. And by the way, thanks for including me. I didn't know this is one of three copies. It's so awesome. <laughs> we, we, we love it. We're, we're, Did you want me to autograph it? <laughs> I should have had you do it while we were there. But I was so busy. I was, I was seriously, this is horrible to admit, but I was so busy going, oh God, no, I do not want to play this game. <laughs> yeah. that, I, that I was so unbelievably pleasantly surprised. It, it's, a, it's an awesome game. I think uh, our fans will definitely be people that like this. But uh, anyway, thanks for joining us on Board Game Friday. Right, well, as a long-time listener to the show, it's been so exciting to finally visit the basement. Great stuff. This uh, Life Sherpa game, OG, you're going to have to check that out. Okay, sounds we'll, good. We will play it sometime. Good stuff. Great stuff, by the way, on Eric's list. And we'll have the full list, as I mentioned, on our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com. Thanks to everybody who's left a review of the show. By the way, we've got this review in that mom has put on her fridge another two days in a row, man. Everybody loves you lately. There is a lot of OG love on the show. We went through people talking about Doug and now it's come to you. Five stars. OG makes the show by not that ladder. Stacky Benjamins has really become one of my favorite podcasts, although I'm really not sure why given I spend a number of hours a week listening and never learn anything. OG seriously makes the show. No offense, Joe, you're loved as well. Thanks guys. Always great content. And the time you invest in the show is obvious. What's up, OG? How about that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, be here all week, folks. She's got a fan. Well, the week's over, man. You're here all weekend now. Oh, snap. Speaking of the weekend, let's get on the weekend. Happy holiday weekend, everyone. So, what did we learn today? First, looking for a good way to talk about money? Take some advice from today's show guests. Great games aren't necessarily the ones teaching you directly about money, but they're making the process of money, business, or economics interesting so that when you're in a learning situation later, you're more open to it and have a point of reference to work from. Second, looking for fun entertainment options with family and friends this holiday season? There are lots of frugal ways to celebrate, including... Sitting around a table and enjoying friends, well, not Joe and OG, but maybe good friends, and an inexpensive board game. While a movie might cost 20 bucks a person or more after you finish buying a ticket and buying popcorn and drinks, a board game might be anywhere from 20 to $60 in total. And the good news? You can bring it out again later and play it without any additional cost. But the big lesson... Don't play Scrabble against Joe's mom. She makes up words like habitat and irreconcilable. What? It's just it's gibberish. The lady's making shit up. It's unbelievable. Don't trust her. Special thanks to Eric Summerer for joining us on today's show. You'll find Eric at the Dice Tower podcast right here on the device where you're listening to us. Thanks also to Vince Scully for joining us. You'll find Vince at lifesherpa.com.au. You can pre-order Vince's game by emailing him at vince at lifesherpa.com.au. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I really thought doing these credits completely naked would have been a lot more fun than it actually was. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor.
So I played Monopoly by the rules. How did that work for you? Well, it's funny. It's such a different game when you actually play by the rules. First of all, it was less than 90 minutes. It was probably 75 minutes. So it wasn't this huge long game that you think it is. The second thing is the game is moody is all get out. It's like your moodiest friend because initially there were four of us playing. Initially, the whole game was going one guy's way. And before you know it, bam, he's bankrupt. Like just totally from just like real life. (laughs) Yes, totally doing great to bankrupt. And people might be asking, well, how does that happen? Well, when you follow the actual rules of Monopoly, the game is meant to suck the life out of the system very, very quickly. And the lifeblood is money changing hands, right? So it's Mm -hmm. sucking money out very quickly. So rule number one is, you know, my dad used to always play with this house rule that that to kind of make it even for the last player to play and for everybody, you can't buy a space until you go once around the board, then you can buy. There's no such rule. I mean, most, most families play with house rules. The second you land on it, you make a decision whether you're going to buy it or not. Here's the other thing that speeds it up. If you don't buy it, the property goes up for auction among all the other players. And what's funny about that. So now there's the extra pressure where at one point in the game, I'd hardly had any money, but I'm on this spot. And if I don't buy it, somebody else is going to buy it. So I have to make the decision. Am I going to buy this or am I going to give it up for, you know, one of my competitors makes you totally sweat in a just completely different way. And then the second thing is when you get these community chest, chance cards, luxury tax, income tax, all these spaces, people used to take that money and they put it in the middle. And if you landed on free parking, parking. you get no such thing. There is no rule. No such thing. It goes, it it goes in the bank. It's the goal with monopoly is to get the damn game done. (laughs) And, and, and it actually was way, way, way more fun playing it when, when it was over that fast. The next thing that, that was, uh, important was this. There's only a lot of, a lot of families have amalgamated sets of, they got grandma's old monopoly, cousin Lou's old monopoly. He left over everybody's monopolies all. In fact, it was funny. A friend of ours brought over their monopoly. It was two monopoly sets, just all in one box, half of one, half of another. So we kind of sorted out the cards. There's a specific number of houses. I don't remember how many, I think it was 33, set number of houses and a set number of hotels. If there's no houses left to buy, you can't buy one. So number one, I had to wheel and deal. I ended up winning the game, which was. Of course. Well, yeah, but it, but it was kind of lucky. I was in third place. The guy in first place goes, goes bankrupt after he lands on park place, which the woman who was in last, my friend Dina, she was in last place. She owned boardwalk and park place. And that was it. She, put a few houses. I think she had three houses on Park Place. The guy in first had just bought some more stuff. He had to mortgage everything. And then he went around the board. He landed on Park Place again. The next time around the board, he was done. Because after you mortgage all your properties, you can't make a deal. Like, you know how in your family Mm -hmm. you go, hey man, if you let me, if you let me land here, I'll let you land three times on my properties. And if you can't do that, it is not allowed. You can't make those. You can make deals for properties, but not for future consideration. You can't do that. So hmm. uh, he's out of the game. But then it was Dina and I that were expanding our properties. And I had to wheel and deal these. I had one of those blue properties on the front, you know, the what, Connecticut and something else, mm-hmm. Vermont and yep, yep, yep. Oriental Avenue. So those those three spaces. I had one of them. I traded one of the electric companies for a merged or for for a mortgaged other blue one, my friend Jason sitting on the other side of me, he was, he was struggling and he just needed cash. I'm like, I'll give you 200 bucks and, and keep it mortgaged. And I'll, and I'll also give you this, uh, electric company. It's like deal. So now I've got two turned to Mike, who was the first guy who was out, but he was struggling mightily. He was between that first time he landed on park place and the second one, I offered him a deal so that he would get a set of three and that would give me a set of three. And so I went from having one of three to finally getting my little set, which was frankly, I think the only set I own the whole game, at least until late in the game. But the, but so I I had to do a bunch of wheeling and dealing and reading. Of course, it's only the Uber nerds who read like how to play Monopoly. So, 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 but after reading at the Monopoly championships, that's what these guys do. 
Like it isn't who has the best die rolls. It's who can wheel and deal properties. And then at right. some, and then at some point you get lucky, right? People land on your stuff versus, and that's what happened at the end of the game. At the end of the game, it was Dean and I, and she landed on my properties three times before I landed on hers once and she was done. But with Jason, Jason had the green spaces. I had the blues and Dina had a couple others. We ate up all the houses between, between two of us. And so there weren't enough houses left for Jason to put on his green spaces. And when he realized what Dean and I were doing, he's like, oh, you need to upgrade to a hotel. <laughs> nope. Because the second I upgrade to a hotel, that puts houses back in circulation that he's going to use against us. Right. So, so my way of making sure Jason lost the game was to stay at four houses on all my properties. It was fantastic. It was. It, it, you're, you're a son of a gun. It, it, it ended up being ruthless. A, well, it, more than that, it just ended up being a fun game. Shark Tank. So, yes, that's what they call me. Shark Tank, Salsi High. <laughs> that rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Average Joe Shark Tank. But I would tell everybody, if you're going to play Monopoly this uh, holiday season, play we'll it Probably the- throw a ticket to ride. That's probably what we'll end up with. Ticket to Ride. Kids are good at it. Ticket to Ride still such a better game than Monopoly is. Oh, yeah, by a country mile. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that list Eric gave us was good stuff too. But um but Monopoly can be much better, I think, than the way you remember it. Okay. 